Welcome to the College Sports Conversations presented by the NCAA. I'm Trey Moses. As part of the Mental Health Awareness Month, we are talking with student athletes about their personal mental health journeys and how they've overcome adversity. This is a topic that I care deeply about as I've gone through my own adversity and my own mental health journey. Our guest today is former Syracuse women's basketball player, Brooke Alexander. Brooke earned her undergraduate degree in international business at UT Arlington before transferring to play a fifth year at Syracuse where she earned a master's in public relations. Brooke, thank you for joining us. Yeah, thank you for having me. How are you today? I'm doing well. Um, I'm really hot in my home. <laughs> There's no AC <laughs> and I live in Texas, so I'm just pushing through. I had to work from home today, but I've got some fans going, so I'm doing good. How long until it's back on? Tomorrow morning at nine. Okay, not, yeah. not too much longer. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, you know, Brooke, your college career took a unique and interesting path. Um, can you take us a little through your journey as a student athlete and your pursuit of opportunity? Yeah, so I actually went to three universities. Um, I started out at Liberty University my freshman year out in Virginia. So I was 18 hours away from home for my family. And about halfway through the season, um, I ended up breaking the starting lineup. And so you know, it looked like I was happy and doing well. And um, I think a lot of people were happy for me and for my success, but in reality, I was super depressed. Um, so I started going to counseling for the first time my freshman year. And at the time it was something I was really embarrassed about. So, <laughs> which is really funny um, because now I don't care. Um, but at the time, you know, if I didn't want any of my friends or teammates to know. So if I had to go to counseling, I was just like, oh, I have an appointment. And they'd be like, oh, okay. And I just never shared it because it was something that I thought, you know, only crazy people went to or, or something of that sort. And so um, it was actually through my counseling sessions that I realized I needed to go back home to play and play closer to home. So I just wasn't living a healthy lifestyle. And so needed to get out. So I went to UT Arlington after that and had a super close bond with my teammates. And um, it was a really good three years. I think um, I think it was my sophomore year that I rededicated my life to Christ. And so my mental health was doing a lot better um, just because I wasn't necessarily putting my worth or value in, into basketball or into a relationship or, or friends or things like that. Um, so I actually started a Bible study. Um, it was actually funny. I, I wanted to start a church and I was 19, single, can't sing, no resources, no money. So I emailed this pastor. <laughs> I emailed this pastor, Chris Bennett, um, at Antioch in Oklahoma. And I had just gotten back from a church conference there and I emailed him and I'm like, I want to start a church out in Arlington. Like we need a church. And he's like, girl, no, like calm down, just start a Bible study. So I was like, oh, okay. So I started a Bible study and um, I got really close to my teammates through that. And I think through that too, um, kind of held me accountable. And, you know, if I'm going to be a mentor or counsel other people, I, I need to make sure that I'm living out what I'm preaching out. Um, and so that really helped me as well. And then after a couple of years, I just kind of felt like, um, I started having kind of visions or dreams about um, like a bigger opportunity and I, and I didn't really understand what it was. And so at the end of my junior year, um, which would have been my senior year in the classroom because I redshirted, I just realized that I think the big opportunity is not at UC Arlington. I think it's somewhere else. And so it was actually through counseling at UT Arlington that I realized I needed to do something for me um, cause I was always doing so many things for other people and I just had a really bad lack of boundaries. And so I kind of had let like 24 seven access to myself, to anyone. And so that's when I started to realize that that wasn't super healthy. Um, and so I went to the transfer portal and that's when God kind of introduced me to Syracuse and I'm like super thankful for my graduate degree I, um, from Newhouse. I graduated from Newhouse with a degree in public relations. Um, and that's how I got my job today. So 
that's kind of my journey and how I got here. It's awesome. Um, my first question from your story is going to be, what were the steps getting you into counseling? Because you know, you had mentioned a little bit of a stigma around it, but how did you actually get into it? Well, if I'm being honest, it was not my idea. Um, my coach at Liberty was really worried about me. And <laughs> so he suggested me to go to the um, like sports psychologist. And um, at first I was super opposed to it. And then, but I didn't really, I mean, I had a choice, I guess, but like when your head coach asks you to do something, you, you know what I'm saying? You don't really have a choice. So, so I went into counseling and I actually really enjoyed it. I remember my first time I just had my arms crossed and I was pretty quiet and um, his name was Chuck and Chuck just super trustworthy and um, promised me that, you know, he could trust, I could trust him and, you know, um, how counseling works is just very confidential and there's, truly no judgment and they just help you realize um, maybe some things that you allow to happen to yourself that's not good for you, but then also some patterns that you may not be aware of. And so that's kind of how I got into counseling. And I think when I went to UT Arlington, I actually didn't go to counseling until maybe my third year there. Um, so my red shirt season, I didn't, uh, my first year playing, I didn't. And I really struggled, but I still had um, kind of like mentors who discipled me um, through like a church group or one of them was athletes in action. And so I would meet with them weekly. So I kind of felt like I didn't need counseling, um, but I did. So my junior year, I was in tears one day after practice and I walked across campus to the counseling center <laughs> and lady at the front desk was like, I definitely scarred her. She was like, uh, I'm like, I need to see a counselor. And she's like, um, so at universities, it's really hard to get into counseling because there's not a lot of staff and there's a lot of students. And I don't know the exact statistic off the top of my head, but there's a lot of students who struggle with mental health. So I think I went in in February. And I was like, I need to schedule an appointment. And she said, well, the next open appointment is in April. And I was like, girl, <laughs> I need it now. Like I need to go to counseling, right? Like that's in two or three months. So I booked it and um, pretty much struggled up till April and but I ended up getting in and I was kind of going through the transfer process as well at the same time, which is super stressful. And also it was really hard because I was really close to everyone at UTA. I had been there for three years and I had poured out pretty much everything physically, spiritually, emotionally, mentally, all into that program. And so it was very difficult to leave a place that was so comfortable and, and familiar to me. So that's kind of how I got through counseling. And when I went to Syracuse, I immediately, there wasn't necessarily anything going on in my life that really needed, um, you know, attention um, in counseling, but I ended up going anyways, because I knew that basketball is really tough and I knew I was going to be going through grad school at the same time. So the moment I stepped on campus at Syracuse, I went into counseling and um, I ended up switching counselors to the team sports psychologist at Syracuse. And he was really helpful. I met with him once a week. And it was super cool too, that he was a sports psychologist because I think sometimes when I was an athlete, at school and and I would be explaining basketball terms and I had a regular counselor, they would, I would have to like spend time explaining kind of basketball terms. Yeah. And like, I didn't, I didn't think that they fully could grasp what an athlete truly went through. And so my counselor or sports psychologist at Syracuse like understood everything and he had professional experience in, in training um, professional athletes. So yeah, and when I got back home, um, I think it was in September, you know, the pandemic hit, I, I did not go to counseling and it wasn't until September that I felt like I needed to again and just to help me um, get through some things from my past. And so I've been working with my counselor now for 
since September every couple of weeks. So that's kind of my story with therapy. That's awesome. What, can you talk a little bit about the importance of counseling to you? Because I know that, um, I'm gonna have a kind of a second question I'm gonna let you answer too. Um, Cause I know that counseling can one, be scary to get into. Um, and two, the, the best advice in terms of counseling that I was given was, um, it's kind of like dating. You know, mm -hmm. it, it takes you a little bit to find your person, that, you know, in, in a sense. Um, so, so like trying to find your, the counselor that works best for you. So can you talk a little bit about um, those two? Yeah, that's actually a really good question because that is something I struggled with. So actually I've had five counselors now, obviously just because I moved every couple of years. Um, but every counselor that I had was a man up until the one I have now, um, which is actually very ironic for me because I strongly trust women. And so it was just kind of funny that all the men that helped me through so much were counselors who were men. And so, um, yeah, when I was at Syracuse, I actually did have a breakup with counselor. And I don't think I did it the right way because in a sense, I ghosted him. <laughs> but you're like, don't do that because like, you're there for mental health reasons. You don't respond back. They freak out and worry. So don't do that. Um, but I just, at the time, I was so bad at telling people no or, or to tell someone um, or like shut someone down. I don't know how else to phrase that, but in a sense, I felt like I was rejecting him. And so I just felt guilty and bad. So I thought, well, maybe I could just not say anything and never <laughs> talk to him again, which like I've grown a lot in that area. I've, it, it was just my fear of hurting people or, or not pleasing somebody. And so I didn't have a breakup. Um, and that's when I switched over to the sports psychologist and it was just, I feel like I could relate a little bit more. And that was something that was really important to me when I moved back home to Frisco was just, I think I want a woman counselor this time. Um, so I don't hold back on anything. And I pretty much Googled like, first of all, financially, I wasn't doing hot. Like I was selling clothes from middle school during the pandemic just to like buy some Chick-fil-A. <laughs> so I was really struggling. <laughs> So I couldn't really afford counseling. And with insurance, it's very tough because a lot of insurance actually doesn't really consider um, like speaking therapy as is the same as like going to the doctor. So I Googled like cheap therapists near me. And then I think my second search was like faith-based because um, it can kind of get a little uncomfortable if you know, let's say you have a religious belief or something and, and the person counseling you either is not educated on it or strongly does not believe in it. It's like really awkward because to you, that's something like your faith is so important to you. And to them, they're like, um, you know, I don't know what to say to you. So it's just awkward. So that was important to me. And so I found her name's Caroline. It's my counselor and, and she couldn't be more, um, perfect. Like, as like as suitable as she is for my uh, mental health. I mean, that was definitely a God thing. She graduated from Baylor and she actually got her degree in public relations, which I was like, okay, <laughs> that's all I need to know. You know, she can relate in a lot of ways. And she actually went to high school in my district. They were our rivals. I went to Prestonwood and maybe I shouldn't like share all of her information, but um, <laughs> Um, I do have a tendency to overshare, so I'm trying to catch myself, but yeah, I mean, it was just funny. She was a volleyball player and we're pretty much the same height. It was like, not that height matters, but it's kind of cool. So it's just, I felt like I could really relate to her in a lot of ways and it helped me open up more. Um, just seeing someone with a familiar face. Um, and so I think my advice to anyone is you know, if you're looking for a counselor, yeah, it is like dating. Like you need to have some expectations or a list or some standards and ways that, you know, like, let's say that you're a certain ethnicity, find someone who's the same ethnicity. Maybe, maybe they will understand you in a way that maybe a white counselor couldn't. 
And for me, it was, I had to find a woman counselor because there was things that a woman could relate to me in a way that I don't think a man could. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, you know, you, you spoke a little bit about being vulnerable. What does vulner vulnerability mean to you? Okay, I'm about to pull out some Brene Brown quotes. <laughs> So have you ever heard of Renee Brown? No. Okay. I will definitely send you her resources. So I first kind of learned about vulnerability at Syracuse. A friend of mine texted me about Brene Brown and I watched her TED talk, which she is a researcher on shame and vulnerability. And she's wrote, written some books about it. So to me, I thought vulnerability was sharing my whole life story to someone in a day. Not normal, vulnerable, or healthy, <laughs> okay. So um, actually vulnerability is not oversharing. Um, you know, vulnerability is having the courage to show up as yourself and, you know, pretty much share what's appropriate to share. So whatever you're not comfortable sharing or whatever, um, you share, make sure that it's to people who have earned that right to hear that. So she has an analogy of like marbles, I think, and you want to be careful. You don't want to put all your marbles into one basket. Pretty sure that was eggs, but her, her example was marbles. So I'm not wrong on that. So she just said, you don't want to put all your marbles into one person because if they break that trust, it's super hurtful. And so she was saying, you know, share a marble here, share a marble there, and, um, and be more selective on who you trust and, and make sure that people are earning your trust before you share super deep vulnerable things, but that it's okay to, if you're struggling to share with someone like, you know what, like I'm not doing too hot today. So um, I just need some extra encouragement. Like that's vulnerability. Now, if you were to go up and say, you know what, like, my boyfriend just cheated on me, my dog died, all this stuff happened. And you're talking to a stranger, like that can be really overwhelming. And it kind of doesn't pull someone towards you. It almost like pushes them away. Yeah. <laughs> um, kind of like, you know, why are you sharing so much with a stranger? Um, so for me, I'm not a very closed off person. And I know a lot of vulnerability talks are more towards opening up, like talking to closed off people. But the way that I relate to it is oversharing and kind of learning boundaries and um, all the things that I talked about, who to trust and um, making sure that they reach my standards before I just pour my heart out, if that makes sense. You know, you've mentioned boundaries a couple of times now. How important is it to set healthy boundaries and stick to them? Yeah, okay. So I'm not the expert yet. Um, but I have grown so much in this area. So I will tell a couple of stories. So when I was at um, Liberty and UTA, I had zero boundaries and I had no idea. Like I, I just thought I was being vulnerable and open. And so let's say I had a Spanish test. Let's say I had weights at six and a Spanish test at eight. And it's, you know, two, three in the morning and I get a phone call. And this would be kind of a consistent thing. Like someone calling me, like, hey, can you come pick me up? And there would be no doubt about it. Like I would just always do that. And I kind of became, um, I don't want to say the team mom, but I will say team counselor. I, I think that I should have gotten paid for all the time. Right? So I actually told my counselor, I was like, Caroline, I think I want to be a counselor, but if you want to be a counselor, you can't cry when other people tell their stories. <laughs> I was like, that's the only thing holding me back is like, they'd be like, girl, I'm not even crying. And my counselor is crying. Like, what am I supposed to do with this? So um, for me, it was just um, kind of setting things like that. Like, it's okay to say no. And it's not mean and it's not hurtful. And I, and, and there's some things I had to learn, like what's okay to say yes to and what's okay to say no to. And that was just basic like friendships I wasn't even relationships or anything like that I mean and also too just I think um, even with authority figures so 
you can stand up for yourself in a way that's not disrespectful. So let's say that your coach kind of says something out of line to you. Um, I was 19, 18, and, I, and I, someone would say something out of line. I would just be like, yes, ma'am, <laughs> yes, sir. And it's like, no, like, that's not okay, you know? Yeah. And, and if you do that, it, it allows that person to know, okay, I can treat this person this way, and, and it's okay, and it's good, and it's not. And so it wasn't until my fifth year that I was able to kind of stand up to myself, for myself um, to authority figures and, and not in a disrespectful way. And just be like, yeah, you know what? Um, I actually can't meet in 10 minutes. I have something planned. And if they're upset about it, that's not my responsibility. So, um, and just not dropping everything to someone else's needs or, or wants at the expense of my own life and health. Um, and so that would probably be my experience with it. Um, I think too, it helps to kind of have standards for yourself and expectations of yourself so that if you do enter, let's say a dating relationship or you have an encounter with a coach where you feel disrespected or with a teammate that you feel is using you in some sort of way, there's a way to go about it that's appropriate and healthy. And if you're able to kind of have that stuff in mind before you enter the problem, it gets easier and you don't have to do it rudely or mean or any type of way. It's just, yeah, you know what? I, I care about you and I care about what you're saying, but at the same time, I have a meeting with my bed and I'm gonna take a nap. So, you know, we'll get back to it after. And I think that's okay to do. You say it's okay. Um... But I know myself included at times can feel very guilty for saying no to someone. Do you have any tips for people who have trouble saying no to people? Okay. <laughs> yeah, I actually bought a book. I wish I had it in front of me so I know where it is. I bought a book on Amazon a year ago titled How to Say No. And I know it's just a two letter word and all you have to do is say no, but it's so tough for somebody who like me I don't know if you know about the Enneagram, but it's like a personality test mm -hmm. and I'm a two. I so you are? Yeah. Oh, okay. I figured when you get, whenever you said you struggled with it. So a two on the Enneagram is a helper. So what a two kind of strives in is um, kind of helping other people's needs and serving other people at the expense of their own. And they may neglect their needs and may not take care of themselves as well but they take very good care of other people. And so it was, it's been really challenging and it still is. And I mean, there, are, there have been times where I told someone no and you know, not everyone's reaction is a good reaction. So it, it helps me whenever someone's understanding. Um, that's typically a marker of if that person has good boundaries, but if the person does not have good boundaries then they may react and feel like you're rejecting them or you don't care, things like that. And so my advice would be stand firm in your no. And um, I mean, if it's something that you feel you can compromise on and if it's a little no, then sure, but don't allow yourself to be manipulated in an emotional way to where you're still not comfortable to do something or you don't have the time to do something for somebody. And, but because of the reaction, you ended up going back against your no, um, I feel like that's taking a step backwards. And I think the better that you get at kind of practicing that, other people pick up on it too. And it kind of weeds out the people who aren't really for you. And I've kind of noticed that in my life, like when I started establishing boundaries when I was about 21 or 22, um, I lost a lot of people and it was very hard and it's still hard. Um, I miss some people, um, but at, at the end of the day, it's good for you and it's healthy for you because the people in your life that are good for your mental health will respect your no and will um, respect your boundaries. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. Um, yeah, that's good. 
um, you know, even while successfully balancing everything on and off the court, um, you found time to write a blog. Mm. What led you to want to do this um, and then also to be so open and vulnerable? Okay, so I'll answer the second part first since I've kind of touched on it. It was not hard for me to be open and vulnerable. In fact, if you go to some of my first blog posts, they're super long and way too, like it's way too much and it's definitely oversharing. And you can kind of see as I get older, they get shorter, better, and more to the point. Um, and a lot of that had to do with um, Newhouse. I, you know, I've, I feel like I've always kind of had a gift and a passion for writing that I got from my mom. And when I went to Newhouse, it's a super prestigious communication school. And it was in one of my classes with actually my, he actually ended up being my thesis advisor. And his name is Professor Brad Horn. And so I had a class with him and for a school assignment, we had to write um, kind of like a series of, of a certain topic. So we had to write two or three blog posts about whatever topic we wanted. And so I chose mine on mental health. I was really struggling at the time. I was, had pretty bad anxiety that I had never really experienced before. And when I was at Syracuse, the first, I'd say for like a, a month or two, I was having panic attacks daily and I felt like I was going crazy. And so those blog posts I wrote, but it was mainly for myself. And, and a lot of my writings are basically experiences that I've had myself. And I just decided to share it because I feel like it could be helpful for other people. So what led me to start this blog? I was 19 years old. I was at UTA and I heard this song by Beyonce called Pretty Hurts. <laughs> Don't laugh, Beyonce is good. So at the beginning of the song, there's this man and well, if you don't, if you don't know Pretty Hurts, um, basically the song is just about girls who go through so many extents and, and do so many things to try to appear as beautiful in society's terms. So, you know, they try to whiten their teeth and bleach their hair and do all these things. Cause Beyonce, when she grew up, she was a beauty pageant. So she's kind of telling her story of how she was judged for her beauty, which when you think about it, that's actually really weird. Um, if you think about it, there's a bunch of young girls being judged by some older men on who's the most beautiful. That's weird. So anyways, that's a whole nother topic. Um, that's I agree with you though. Yeah, I mean, that's strange. So she's kind of just going through her story. At the very beginning of the song, um, this man who is one of the, or I guess he's the host, he's not a judge and he's like, um, what is your aspiration in life? And so Beyonce shares and she's like, my aspiration in life is to be happy. And when I heard that, I was like, something didn't sit right with me. I'm like, really? Like, that's it? Like, you just want to be happy? That's such a temporary fleeting feeling. And so I um, kind of wrote my experience with trying to chase happiness through a relationship, through friends, through my sport, through pleasing my coach, through accolades, all these different things. But at the end of the day, I think I wrote about Paul in, in scripture, talks about, you know, what you really want to strive for is joy, which is a more um, eternal type of, it's not really a feeling, it's, um, I don't really know how to, how to describe that, but you know, there's a difference between joy and happiness. So happiness is like, oh, I just got Dr. Pepper. I'm happy. Or I, you know, um, I just got a dog. And, and joy is even when you are going through hell and even when you are going through the worst times, you're still finding a way to find a purpose in living and you're still finding a way to be happy, essentially. And it doesn't necessarily mean that your circumstances are the greatest or the happiest, but you're staying true to yourself and your beliefs, no matter what's going on. And so that's kind of how I started my blog. And I just wanted to write on that topic and then kind of just ended up writing about more things. There's been times where there was a long period of time where I didn't write. And that was usually when I was struggling mentally. It's pretty difficult for me to write when I'm really low. Um, but I think some of the most raw and beautiful words 
are actually written when you're writing in a time of kind of depression, which sounds really dark and awful, but it's true. I mean, because you, that's when you're kind of showing up as your most authentic self. Like, yeah, I'm struggling, but I'm still going to write about these things and I'm still going to try to encourage other people and, and, and myself at, while I do that. So, um, yeah, I mean, I haven't written in the blog in a while, probably like a year and a half, kind of for the same reasons. Um, I just didn't feel like I had the strength to write, but I actually started writing again, um, I think in about last summer, I started writing again. And so I'll probably start the blog up again and, and I know how to write better blog posts without it being super long. Um, yeah, you'll have to let me know, I'll check it out for sure. Um, you know, you mentioned what Paul says about joy. When, if you, do you feel like you're at that point in life where, you know, kind of what you mentioned? Yeah, I do. Um, and it took me a really long time to get here. And what did it really take for you to get there? Um, <laughs> if you can, I know you could th think about everything you've been through or, and stuff but what is it, what do you feel like it really took for you to get to that point instead of just chasing happiness or um you know what I think it was my year at Syracuse I left everything that was familiar to me in Texas and you know I went to Syracuse out in New York and by myself I was super excited but I was going through a lot of things I lost a lot of people I went through a breakup I lost a couple of mentors. I know I upset some people when I transferred because they felt betrayed um, and I lost some friends. And I was just going through a lot of things all at the same time while trying to adjust to New York. <laughs> and um, that was kind of when I think, I kind of had a good idea. Uh, you know, I, I don't think that I came in blindsided and not equipped at all because I had uh, mentors and I, and I did go to counseling and did the work. So when I went to Syracuse, it wasn't like, there's also a, a verse in, in the Bible that talks about um, being strong enough to where um, when the wind blows, you don't get knocked over. And so that when a strong wave comes, you're able to handle it because a little thing of wind isn't gonna blow you over. So I think I had been through enough to when, when I got to Syracuse, I was like, okay, God, like this is a lot of stuff and a lot of loss. And I actually think that that was my refining moment where I really found myself. And unfortunately I was pretty broken hearted um, in a lot of ways and a lot of areas, but I was still able to find that joy. So in December, at my year at Syracuse, I was like, okay, I'm going to get a golden retriever. And I don't really care if my mom and dad don't want me to, this is my money and I need it. Like I need this. And I actually have a prayer in my journal where I'm like, God, please let me find a golden retriever. <laughs> like like he, he hears the prayers. Okay. That's, that's an important prayer. So I Googled like golden retrievers near me and there was one for 350 bucks and I'm like this can't be a better deal it's super sketchy but I'm doing it and so I drove out there with one of my best friends and she was my teammate at Syracuse Elemy. after practice one day I drove an hour and a half to Little Falls which is a farm area and there was a um, set of 10 puppies and it's, you know, four feet of snow, we're in the farm, it's pitch black, I can't see anything, it's super sketchy. In fact, when we pulled up, we're like, dude, like, this looks like it's a scary movie. <laughs> what are we doing? <laughs> like, why did we do this? So I'm like, I will risk my life for this golden retriever. So we go and we ask this man, you know, well, can we take out the golden retrievers? They were in a pen, like, outside. And he's like, sure. So he opens it up and they all just shoot flying everywhere. And they're like, they got the zoomies, they're in the snow, they're playing with the cows. And I'm like, how am I gonna find a dog? <laughs> so at that point it just became whatever dog that we catch, like we're gonna get it. And at the time I wanted a, 
a boy golden retriever just because I've always had a male dog. And so we kept picking them up and they would be girls. And we picked one of the boys up, but he was like so distracted. So I'm like, I can't, we're not connecting. I can't get this one. And then there was this one puppy in this white pen with a baby cow. And Elamie's like, what about that one? And so the man goes in there, he picks the dog up and he hands it to us. And we're like, oh, it's a girl. And I'm like, well, I'll hold on to her while we find a boy. So I'm holding on to her and she's like cuddling up to my arm. And I'm like, oh my gosh, like I could cry. And she was just in my arms for about 10 minutes. And I think we picked up another boy and he was not interested. And so then I just looked at Elamie and I was like, you know what, why don't I just get this one? And so that's how I got Zoe. And from that point forward, not saying I didn't struggle or, or, ha or go through anything after that, but it, it just made kind of the dark things going on seem so insignificant. And I think sometimes when you're going through something really hard, you can really focus on the wound and kind of to the point where it can become unhealthy. Um, and I, and I don't know that I could have avoided that without Zoe. So I would literally be in practice and I would just be smiling. And it was because I'm like thinking about Zoe, like something funny she did. And I just kept thinking to myself, like, I can't wait to get home to Zoe. Like nothing else matters. And so she helped me and, and truthfully, she helped my roommates as well. And so I was kind of the start. And then I think the other part too was I started kind of redirecting my purpose and being on the basketball team at Syracuse. And I think sometimes when things don't really go the way that you thought they would or, or things don't go the way that you want, um, it's easy to just go through the motions and just try to survive. And I just didn't want to be in survival mode for my last year of college basketball. So I started focusing on whenever we would warm up, whether it was at um, the dome and it was a home game or an away game, I started engaging with fans at sat court side. And so that was something I started to look forward to was speaking with girls, you know, young girls, um, you know, there to watch us and they view us as like celebrities. So I, it was just like funny to me because I started like forming like a mini like Brook fan base <laughs> and, and it was really cool for me, but I just felt like that gave me so much purpose. Like I can make this, I can make it through. And I, and there's so many things that are so much more important than just basketball, you know? And so instead of just struggling, I mean, thinking about my struggles and, and what was going wrong, I just started looking for ways to encourage other people. And I think in return that encouraged me. That's awesome. It is. It's uh, I think it's awesome when that having that fan engagement, um, yeah. but on a, like a more personal level, I was kind mm -hmm. of the same way at Ball State where I kind of talked to a couple of fans and, you know, got to know them by name and stuff. So I think, yeah. Awesome. A um, couple more questions for you. Um, you know, you mentioned Athletes in Action. They've done a lot for me and I've done some stuff for them. Um, very close relationship with a couple of, of the guys in there. Um, can, you know, can you talk a little bit about, for those that don't know what Athletes in Action is and kind of like your relationship with them? Yeah, so I had that at UTA. Um, and I'm pretty sure we had it at Liberty. I just, I don't know that I was involved. But at UT Arlington, we had a guy involved he was a leader in athletes in action and so we got connected instantly it's basically a christian organization um in insta -A. i'm pretty sure it's they're involved with insta -A and it's athletes in every sport and i think they do mission trips and like kind of like group camps and things like that i never personally got to go um but it was really helpful for me just because they would come to my practices. They would encourage me um, every year. Jeff was the leader and, and every year he would have kind of like a woman closer to our age to meet with whoever wanted to meet with her. And so um, 
I think it was my second year there. I started meeting with a track star who actually holds like some hurdle records for Columbia for the Olympics. She ran track at uh, UT. And so um, I would meet with her once a week and that really helped me. I mean, we would just meet at the coffee shop or Starbucks at um, the school bookstore every Thursday. And it was something I always looked forward to. I would spill the tea, you know, and <laughs> she was like, it's just awesome because we, we were so opposite. She's very introverted and, and soft spoken and quiet. And um, obviously if you can't tell, I, I could talk forever. So <laughs> Um, that was that was awesome. I, I really appreciate them, and I'm still connected with Jeff and everything that he's done for me. Um, so, I was lucky enough to go to New Zealand with Athletes in Action going into my. I heard about that one. Yeah, so I was definitely invited to that one. I wish I could have gone. Um, you know, my last question to you is: when when it's all said and done, what do you want people to take away most from your story? I would say, um, one, never lose confidence in yourself. Um, no matter what anyone else thinks, you know, what numbers you're producing in your sport, um, what your playing time is, or what your coach thinks of you, none of that matters. Um, at the end of the day, what matters is how you feel about yourself. And I think a lot of what mental health is, is internalizing other people's words and projecting it onto ourselves and, and taking their lies as truth. And I really struggled with that. So I think for me, it would just be always believe in yourself, always have confidence no matter what, and really be selective on what you take in and what you listen to. And I don't just mean music and shows and stuff like that. I mean, the words that people choose to speak to you. Um, I got to a point when I was 21 and that's when I started really doing well in basketball was sometimes I would hear something and I would be respectful, but it would be like in one ear at the other, like I'm not listening to that because I know who I am and I know what I can do. And, um, if you, if you internalize every single word, um, your highs will be really high, but your lows will be so low. And so I think that really helped me. It's awesome. Brooke. Thank you for joining us today, um, sharing your story and just being vulnerable and open. Um, you know, we really appreciate it. I know um, you probably have a busy schedule. You took time out to, you know, meet with me and, you know, it's been awesome getting to know you over this last 45 minutes or so. And I uh, just really appreciate you being open. Yeah, thank you, no problem. Um, and thank you to our audience for tuning in throughout this month as we focus on mental health awareness and have had very meaningful and impactful conversations with current college athletes. For more about my journey, you can also check out the One in Five podcast on iTunes and Spotify. This has been College Sports Conversations presented by the NCAA. We look forward to talking with you again.